happy Saturday. This week in our six impossible episodes about Mother Goose rhymes, we talked about some nursery rhymes that are purportedly about events that we have covered on the show before. One of those, Rockabye Baby, is sometimes interpreted as being about the birth of James Francis Edward Stewart. Our episode on this was from way back on July 4th, 2016. So we thought we would bring it out for a Saturday classic. It's the Jacobite Rising of 1745. And of course, uh, we talk about Outlander a bit on this episode. And naturally at this point, almost five years later, the TV show Outlander has moved on to other things. How dare they? (laughs) So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I am Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Largely thanks to the Outlander books and TV show, we have gotten so many requests to talk about today's topic (laughs) in so many different forms. Uh, I'm not exaggerating. This goes all the way back to when we very, very first started on the show. Bonnie Prince Charlie is number 11 on our hundreds and hundreds of suggestions long uh, listener suggestions document. I'm not kidding when I say hundreds and hundreds. There are at least 600 things on there, but I haven't updated in a while. So if I update from what's in our email, it's probably closer to almost a thousand. Yeah. Uh, and then in addition to Bonnie Prince Charlie being number 11, the Jacobite Rebe- Rebellion and the Battle of Culloden are both all on there as well, like within the top 20% of suggestions ordered chronologically. And they just, the hits just keep coming. I had to laugh because yeah. last night Tracy sent me the outline for this in an email and like seconds later an email came in asking for this very topic. Yeah, I answered that this morning and said, coincidentally, we're recording that today. I don't get to do that very often. So portrayals of this piece of Scottish and English history are often simultaneously heavily romanticized and just phenomenally oversimplified. Uh, I thought this episode was going to be a lot easier than it was, frankly, before I really got into it. Um, And a lot of times these sort of historical fiction-esque uh, depictions play out with Highland Scots as these sort of noble savages and they're fighting to put a Scot back on the throne of the of, of Great Britain. And then while the Scottish Highlands were definitely home to a unique culture and a unique social s- system and the House of Stuart did originate as a Scottish royal house, as is so often the case, it is just way more complicated than that. I sound a little tired because it has taken me two and a half weeks to understand it. (laughs) And you could mark the beginning of this story at so many places in the history of the British Isles. We're going to start with the Glorious Revolution of 1688 to 1689, more than 50 years before the uprising itself. At that time, King James VII of Scotland and II of England lost the throne to William of Orange, stadholder of the Netherlands. William of Orange was both James's nephew and his son-in-law thanks to his marriage to Mary II, James's daughter. James was Catholic, and some of his pro-Catholic policies, along with policies that promoted tolerance of Protestant dissenters, had really alienated a lot of England's Protestant pop- uh, population. The birth of James's son, James Francis Edward Stuart, on June 10th of 1688, meant that the Catholic king would have a Catholic heir, and this was actually such a big deal that it spawned a whole conspiracy theory. This conspiracy theory was that the infant James, also known as the Old Pretender, was really an imposter baby who had been sneaked into his mother's bed to ensure that there would be a Catholic line of succession. I don't know why imposter. This is false, by the way. Imposter baby is the (laughs) best phrase. Like, it's just witty. (laughs) After the birth of James Edward, several Protestant politicians went to William of Orange, also a Protestant, inviting him to come to England, bring an army, and set things right. William was enemies with France, and French power in Europe had been growing for decades. He thought that if he was able to draw on the resources of both Britain and the Netherlands, he'd be better able to resist France's advances. After a series of desertions within James's army and failed negotiations, the Stuarts eventually fled to France. 
And with James gone, William of Orange and his wife Mary took his place. A parliament was assembled, which ultimately agreed to treat James's flight to France as an abdication of the throne and to formally offer the crown to William and Mary together. This, in a nutshell, is the Glorious Revolution. During and after all of this, the Jacobites were James's supporters, named after the Latin form of his name. And there were lots of reasons people joined the Jacobite cause. In Ireland, religion was a big factor since Catholicism was the primary religion in most of Ireland and the Stuarts were Catholic. In England, which didn't have a large Catholic population, many Jacobites were Anglican but thought this parliamentary interference in the line of royal succession was wrong. The royal house of Stuart itself hailed from Scotland, while the house of Orange was Dutch. So the idea of restoring a Scottish house to the throne was one of many roots of Jacobite support in Scotland. The Glorious Revolution is often described as bloodless, but this was really only true in England. Beginning almost immediately and continuing over the next six decades, there were multiple violent attempts made primarily from Scotland and Ireland to overthrow William and Mary and their successors and to put James and his successors back on the throne. The Williamite War in Ireland, with the Jacobites on one side and the Williamites on the other, began in 1689 and went on for two years, including the July 1st, 1690 Battle of the Boyne, in which both William and James were present as monarchs on opposite sides. Another organized rebellion, known as the Jacobite Rebellion of 1715, the 15 Rebellion, or Mars Rebellion, also played out unsuccessfully, mainly in the highlands of Scotland. It followed the death of Queen Anne. Anne was Mary's sister, and apart from James Edward Stuart, was the last of the House of Stuart living at the time. Yeah, the Stuarts yet to come in the story had not been born yet. There had actually been some discussion over the years of restoring the House of Stuart to the throne under the condition that they abandoned their Catholic religion, and that, of course, had not flown. So before Anne's death, her successor had been established in the English Parliament's Act of Settlement in 1701, which also specified that the monarch had to be Anglican. Per the terms of that act, the new monarch would come from the German royal house of Hanover. That first Hanover monarch was George I. So the Jacobite Rebellion of 1715 tried and failed to put James Francis Edward on the throne in spite of the criteria outlined in the Act of Settlement. The Williamite War and the 15 Rebellion are just two examples. When 1745 rolled around, bringing with it the most famous Jacobite Rebellion, unsuccessful attempts to bring back the Stuarts had been going on for decades, especially in Scotland and Ireland. Some of these had been backed by France, and in their wake, exiled Jacobite leaders had established communities of sympathetic supporters on the mainland of Europe. By the time the Jacobite uprising of 1745 occurred, the Jacobite cause had advocated first for James VII and II, who died in 1701, and then for his son, James Edward, who was at this point still living. A big player in the 1745 uprising was James Edward's son, Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie or the Young Pretender. We'll talk more about Bonnie Prince Charlie and how the 1745 rebellion came about after a brief sponsor break. To get back to the life of Bonnie Prince Charlie, Charles Stewart was born on December 31st, 1720. Just before Charles turned 20, Holy Roman Emperor Charles VI died, and this destabilized parts of Europe as his daughter, Maria Theresa, struggled to retain the throne in what became known as the War of Austrian Succession. France saw this chaos as an opportunity to once again support the Jacobite cause and restore the Stuart line to the throne. Although, following the failure of the 15 Rebellion that we discussed before the break, France was reluctant to actually commit any troops to this endeavor. 
It was a bit of a game of international will they or won't they over the next five years, until finally in late 1744, James Edward, who was now in his 50s, sent his son Charles from Rome to Scotland in secret with the hope of rallying support for the Jacobite cause. Charles went by way of France with the hope of securing direct French support. And he did actually get it, uh, but things did not go according to plan. Charles's disappearance from Rome did not go unnoticed, and England pretty quickly intuited that an invasion was imminent. So it positioned a fleet of ships to defend itself from a French attack. So this fleet was large enough that when the French troop transports caught sight of it, they turned back and went back to France, where unusually stormy weather destroyed or damaged most of them. This meant that once Charles did actually get to England, he was basically on his own, without the 15,000 French troops that he had been promised. He did, however, get a bit of a boost on April 30th, 1745, when France defeated British, Dutch, Austrian, and Hanoverian forces at the Battle of Fontenoy, part of the ongoing War of Austrian Succession. The English defeat boosted Jacobite morale, and people began to hope that they might see a similar victory on British soil. Hoping that this victory would bolster his support in the highlands of Scotland, Charles made his way there. He and a small entourage set sail for the western coast of Scotland, dodging English vessels the whole way, and he arrived there on July 23, 1745. At this point, the highlands of Scotland were home to tight-knit clans which rolled family, civic, government, and economic ties all into one unit. The clan system had been in place for centuries, and it was a sort of semi-feudal system that both drew from and influenced family relationships, communities, and the region's economy. Members of each clan lived together uh, in communities that operated like joint tenancy farms. The clan system was also quite militaristic, with each clan maintaining a fighting force to both defend itself from neighboring clans and to raid its neighbors for goods and resources. So, to rally a fighting force in the highlands of Scotland, Charles had to convince clan leaders to join him, and where they went, their clans and their clan's fighting forces would also follow. In this, at first, he really faced huge resistance. The clan leaders that he met with were all unwilling to support him unless he could provide actual troops to back him up. They all remembered pretty well what had happened the last time the Jacobites had tried to rebel. And he couldn't, at that point, offer them any actual troop support. Uh, He also couldn't try to just go back to Rome because there were English warships at every route of escape, keeping him from doing that exact thing. So, with the odds heavily stacked against him, he started trying to win the support of Donald Cameron of Lochiel, chief of Clan Cameron. Several other clans sympathetic to the Jacobite cause had said they would join if Lochiel did. Charles's argument was that while he did not have the aid of foreign troops, nearly the entire British military was occupied elsewhere due to the War of Austrian Succession. So if the clans rallied their forces at this point, they would have superior numbers. And once France saw what the Jacobites could do with those numbers, France would also send aid. Lachiel ultimately agreed, and as they said they would, other clans began to commit their troops. This is where I realized how much of this had literally nothing to do with who was on the throne of Great Britain. <laughs> like <laughs> the whole lot of it was like, well, we gotta, we gotta take advantage of the War of Austrian Succession. Like France had its own motives. Everybody, there was a whole lot going on here that had other motivations besides the straight up question of who is on the throne. Uh Because Bonnie Prince Charlie knew that part of his appeal in Scotland was the idea of restoring a Scottish house to the throne, he started adopting traditional Highland dress, think tartan and kilts, and learning Scots Gaelic. By mid-August, more than 1,200 Highland Scots had joined the cause, including 280 from the Stuarts of Appen, 300 from the McDonald's of Clan Ranald or Clan Ranald. We were not 100% certain on pronunciation there. 250 from Clan Cameron and 400 from a combined force of the McDonald's of Glengarry and the Grants of Glen Morriston. 
Meanwhile, news of Charles' arrival and his muster of clan forces in the highlands of Scotland reached Edinburgh, and Sir John Cope, commander-in-chief of the regular forces in Scotland, started assembling a response. Although Bonnie Prince Charlie had found support in the highlands, this support was actually far from universal. The leadership of Clan Campbell, in particular, was loyal to George II, and consequently... The clan supported the king as well, whether it was out of loyalty to the monarch or to the clan itself. There's also some argument to be made that some of Clan Campbell's loyalties were influenced by seeing this as an opportunity to get back at other clans they had grievances with, including Clan Cameron. So the support on the the government side, which is how we're going to refer to that, uh, that force that sometimes was made up of you know, not only people from the the lowlands of Scotland, which didn't have quite as much emotional ties to what was going on, uh, and clan forces that were were supportive of the current reigning monarch. Through the summer and early fall, the Jacobite and governmental forces followed one another around a huge swath of the Scottish Highlands. First, the Jacobite force fortified itself at Corrieric Pass with the hope of meeting the Loyalist force there. But Cope, having received intelligence of what Charles was planning, diverted his forces to Inverness, hoping to meet the Jacobites on more favorable ground. This plan might have given Cope the upper hand if the Jacobite force had actually pursued him to Inverness. Instead, Charles decided to take advantage of the fact that the Scottish capital of Edinburgh was now virtually undefended and he decided to take over it, continuing to recruit more troops and raise funds through taxation along the way. The Jacobites also occupied the city of Perth as they made their way to Edinburgh. As Cope realized his error in leaving Edinburgh undefended, he retreated back to it by sea, hoping that he would arrive before Charles did. And he did not. Edinburgh was defended by the city guard only, uh, and that meant only about 600 troops who were commanded by an 87-year-old man who had to be carried on a stretcher. This is not exactly a vital military force. After a couple of days of negotiations, with the city attempting to look much more defended than it really was, a few hundred of the Jacobite force basically forced their way in as a negotiator tried to return to the city on September 17th. So the Jacobites took control of Scotland's capital, with the exception of Edinburgh Castle, with almost no effort at all, although the troops in the castle would pester the Jacobite force for the whole time that they occupied the city. While Charles's force was able to rally a little more support from Edinburgh, giving him about 2,400 men total, he still wasn't armed very well. Although they'd basically walked into an essentially undefended Edinburgh, the city of Edinburgh had had the sense to store all of their weapons in the castle, which the Jacobite force couldn't get into. So when Charles heard that Cope was headed toward the village of Preston, he decided to follow suit with an army that was bigger than it had been before, but not necessarily better armed than what the loyalists or the governmental side had. In late September, both forces converged on the village of Preston Pens. Cope's force found a defensible position near the neighboring village of Trenent. At first, the Jacobite force took the high ground to the south and then realized a marsh at the bottom of the hill would keep them from actually reaching the governmental army. Cope, of course, had not expected an attack from across a marsh and had to redeploy his forces to face the ill-placed Jacobite army. Early in the morning of September 21st, partially hidden by very misty weather, the Jacobite army used a small footpath that one of the locals had told them about to reach Cope's force. The Highland force charged the Loyalist army, which was basically hemmed in without enough room to really maneuver. maneuver. The, uh, The governmental force was also pretty much taken by surprise. They had been alerted to the fact that something was going on by a barking dog, but that really added more to the chaos than actually allowing them to plan a response. In less than 10 minutes, Cope's army was effectively routed. There were about 35 deaths and 75 injuries among the Jacobite force, while Cope's side saw about 150 deaths and at least 1,000 taken prisoner. Bonnie Prince Charlie also took Cope's military chest, which contained between 3,000 and 4,000 pounds. This whole incident was recently on an episode of Outlander. (laughs) 
<laughs> doing more or less pretty much what we just described here, actually. Uh, and probably other things we're going to talk about soon are going to be in future episodes of Outlander that will have actually come out by the time this episode comes out. So that's a weird time travel for everyone. Anyway, afterward, the Jacobite force was exuberant. Not only had they outrun and outmaneuvered the British army, taken Perth and taken Edinburgh, and then soundly defeated the army on the battlefield, they also halved the size of the opposing force, and then they had come away with much better funding thanks to the government's war chest that they made away with. But this, however, was not to last. So we're going to talk more about how things progressed after we pause for a brief word from one of our fantastic sponsors. Unsurprisingly, after the Battle of Preston Pans, the Jacobites were a little bit overconfident. They'd hoped that the victory would rally foreign support to their cause, and the victory had been decisive. So for about six weeks, the Jacobites continued to occupy Edinburgh and tried to get Louis XV to send real, actual support from France. They also tried to recruit more Scots to their army, which they did, although most of this support came from outside, not within Edinburgh. The population of Edinburgh was kind of like, we'll let you be here because you have weapons, but we, we don't really care to join your cause. Eventually, France, while still declining to send actual troops, did send some weapons. Meanwhile, England got to work recovering from the defeat at Preston Pans, including pressing people into service and recalling forces that had been fighting elsewhere in Europe. Field Marshal George Wade, who was actually responsible for the construction for most of the military roads the armies were traveling on, was in command of one force. William, Duke of Cumberland, George II's third son, was recalled from Holland to command another. Hearing about these forces, Charles started pushing to move his army and try to strike before the governmental forces got too big to be beaten. His advisors, though, kept cautioning him to wait. They didn't think they were going to be successful at that point. And he finally wound up dividing his force into two columns to proceed toward Carlisle in England. Basically, the idea was they were going to keep pressing forward until they actually got to London. Charles now had 5,000 infantry and 500 cavalry, and he was much better armed, rested, and trained than before this several-week stay in Edinburgh. While this is often portrayed as Charles commanding an army of Highland Scots, by this point, the army was really much broader than that. There were 13 Highland clan regiments plus five lowland regiments. They also had 13 pieces of artillery, some sent from France, and some recovered from the field at Preston Pans. Although they did have some desertions along the way, because at this point the army was getting farther and farther away from home, both prongs of the Jacobite force did reach Carlisle successfully and convinced the mayor to surrender both the town and the castle, this time having learned from having not had the castle when they were in Edinburgh. The Jacobites Jacobites availed themselves of the town's supply of gunpowder, ammunition, and muskets, along with a large number of broadswords that had been confiscated from Jacobite rebels during the 15 rebellions. Those were still hanging around from the last big uh, Jacobite uprising. And this is where things started to go a little awry for the Jacobite army. They couldn't stay in Carlisle. If they did, the government force might pen them in. And Charles said that he had intelligence of more Jacobite support at other towns in the area. So they left Carlisle, intending to gather that support as they went. That support didn't really come, though. The towns they were passing through didn't really care, or at least didn't care enough to join them. It became clear that there really wasn't a lot of Jacobite support to be rallied in northern England, or at least not enough support to justify the risks of staying in England. Eventually, Charles's council of war convinced him that retreating back to Scotland was his only option. And that retreat began on December 6th of 1745. And by this point, the Jacobite army was starting to show signs of strain. Quite a bit of equipment was left behind in Derby, where the army had been billeted. And many of them hadn't been told they were going to Scotland, and they were furious when they learned they were not actually in pursuit of the Duke of Cumberland and then pressing on to London. 
As their journey progressed back northward, the towns they passed through went from being unimpressed by their efforts to actively hostile. More than once as the Jacobite force moved north in early December, the towns they approached actually fired upon them. They wound up reaching Scotland after a treacherous crossing of the River Esk on December 20th. On January 17th, 1746, Jacobite and governmental forces met at the Battle of Falkirk, an overall chaotic and disorganized event in which both sides claimed to be the victors. Neither built upon this supposed victory, though. The Jacobite force continued to retreat toward Inverness, and the Hanoverian force, heavily slowed down by their supply carts and other equipment, decided to wait out the winter until travel conditions were better. So the winter passed uh, without a lot of organized action on either side, but the winter itself was really hard. The Jacobite force lost a lot of men through desertions, and after the winter, their supplies were critically low. They'd also run out of money, and even if they'd had money, the British Navy had formed a blockade to keep them from being able to resupply. So when it came to the final battle on Culloden Moor, just uh, a little ways away from Inverness, in April of 1746, the Jacobite force was down from a peak of about 8,000 men to less than 5,000 infantry and 150 cavalry. Cumberland's army, on the other hand, had more than 9,000, some of whom were Highlanders that were loyal to the Hanoverian succession. Cumberland's force was better trained and better armed than the Jacobites. Its artillery volleys were more effective. While many of the Jacobite force were armed with swords and shields and charged in for hand-to-hand combat, Cumberland's force nearly all had muskets and were able to shoot them down. One portion of the Jacobite force actually got bogged down in marshy ground and never even reached Cumberland's lines before being killed. The Battle of Culloden was over in just 40 minutes. About 2,000 Jacobites were killed, wounded, or taken prisoner. Cumberland, on the other hand, had only about 50 dead and 250 wounded. Nearly all of the Jacobite deaths were Highland Scots, as the Lowland regiments had been in a second line to cover the retreat. While some of the Jacobite force were ready to press on and find some way to recover from their defeat at Culloden, Bonnie Prince Charlie issued his final order as, quote, let every man seek his own safety as best he can. He ultimately fled, went into hiding, and escaped Scotland disguised as a maidservant to a woman named Flora MacDonald. The consequences of the Jacobite uprising of 1745 on the highlands of Scotland were devastating. Cumberland moved through the area for several weeks on a campaign of destruction and retribution. His force destroyed buildings, including Catholic and Episcopalian churches, as well as homes and public buildings. He drove off cattle and destroyed plows belonging to known or suspected Jacobite leaders. The Highland Scots were ordered to surrender their arms, and fugitives fleeing from Cumberland's force headed farther into the Highlands, where many of them died of starvation. There were also wanton and random shootings, as well as rapes. Jacobite leaders, sympathizers, and suspected sympathizers were hanged, and several peers known to have Jacobite leanings were beheaded. The people who were tried were sentenced to death, but their sentences were commuted to lifetime indentured labor and being transported elsewhere. And many of the elements of Highland life that had made the region's culture so distinctive were outlawed, including the wearing of tartan and traditional Highland dress. The Highland clearances followed, in which whole extended families were systematically evicted over the course of a century. The clan system couldn't survive in the face of all of this destruction and displacement, and it was effectively wiped out. Yeah, while the clans themselves as families and family names and, and, you know, family trees still exist, that system of government and economics doesn't exist anymore and was wiped out basically immediately. This is one of the reasons why the whole the the whole uprising uh in in modern retellings is often treated in such a romanticized way because of this idea that like there was a unique local culture that uh was effectively wiped out in retaliation afterward. Bonnie Prince Charlie went into exile on September 20th, 1746, and he never returned to Scotland. He died in 1788 having become quite bitter and having developed problems with alcohol. 
And although he had a brother, that brother died without an heir, and that put an end to the House of Stuart. That's kind of a downer ending. But everybody wanted it. Every, so many people want it. And if you watch Outlander, this episode is coming out like toward the end of this season of Outlander. And this season of Outlander has really got a lot of uh, this part of history as kind of the backdrop and definitely has the the running theme of the Highland culture is going to be destroyed if the Battle of Culloden doesn't go our way. Like that's that's said in almost those exact words uh, more than one time. Um, the there is some arguments to be made that at least some people in the Highlands of Scotland who were in favor of a Stuart restoration to the throne were hoping to preserve the clan system of life, not so much just clans as families and relationships, but like the clan system um, as a, a social and economic system. They were hoping uh, that a Stuart restoration would preserve that for a little while because at this point, the lowlands of Scotland had become much more urban and much more similar to how things operated socially and economically in England. Um, and, and a lot of the clans were really reluctant to see that sort of change starting to already happen in the Highlands before the Jacobite rebellions began. So they were sort of hoping to stave off that change a little longer. Uh, none of which was unfortunately successful. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. Our old How Stuff Works email address no longer works. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.